Recording has started. And Lauren McGrath, Willistown Conservation Trust. All right, so you all look invigorated after the seven minute break. Um, so I'm gonna talk briefly about Willistown Conservation Trust. Um, work with the sensor station program. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the Willistown Conservation Trust, we're located in Newtown Square. And we have a newly established watershed program. It got started in 2017, so it coincided nicely with this rollout. Um, so we're located, this is Ridley Creek State Park. Um, we're located north of it, and we are active in the Ridley, Crum, and Darby Creek watersheds. Um, currently, we have two sensor stations located in Ridley Creek. Um, this green outline is Ashbridge Preserve, which is one of the three preserves that we manage. Um, the sensor stations are located above and below this large legacy sediment site. So if you look at Google Maps, it still looks like a lake. Where, where is Rushton? Is that Rushton is, so this is um, Strasburg Road. Rushton is right okay. about here. So our upstream sensor location, oh, so the updates are we have two sensor stations. We're scheduled to install two more on June 4th, but as is tradition with sensor installations, it's already been delayed once. Um, our first two sensor stations were, huh? It's like a house closing. Um, our first two sensor stations were delayed about three months uh, due to severe snowstorms and ice storms. Um, and now it's rain. So uh, all four of our stations are going to be equipped with dissolved oxygen sensors um, that will be timed to take readings at the same time as the Mayfly sensors. So currently, they're not all together in the same unit, but we'll have to kind of correlate the data all together um, once we start doing analysis. So we've got two sensors right now up here. The third is going to go a little further downstream, and then we're going to put one on Crumb Creek um, as our control site. So this is our upstream sensor location. It's a pretty typical Piedmont stream. You've got a really nice cobble gravel um, substrate, good okay buzz, um, and a nice riparian buffer. There is a wastewater treatment plant that comes in just upstream of our sensors. So we do get a lot of noise from those discharges, um, regular conductivity spikes, but it's got a tertiary treatment plant um, swamp, and it is a very small, I think it's 500,000 gallons a day, so it's pretty low impact for a wastewater treatment plant. Our downstream site is a little different. Um, it is right now almost exclusively reed canary grass. This, you can see that's Matt for scale. Um, we have about a, <laughs> we have about a, a four foot difference um, between the water table and the floodplain. Uh, so the plan right now is to reforest it. This is a very um, <laughs> fantastic <laughs> simulation. <laughs> Um, this is, <laughs> uh, so we are, we have our first big tree planting next Thursday, um, so it's the first of four stages. This is a five acre meadow, right? Meadow is a very loose term, uh, wasteland is kind of what we call it. Um, so we are starting right now to get everything prepped and ready. We'll have spring and fall plantings for the next two years to get everything in the ground. Uh, the plan is hopefully that the trees survive and shade out the stream channel. Um, we, so our downstream sensor, the hypothesis was we could look during storm events to see sediment movement out of this legacy site um, and compare the upstream and downstream data. But unfortunately, what we found is that our turbidity sensor is kind of a mess. This is a Friday. We just cleaned the sensor. It looks great, out of focus, a little muddy, no big deal. Uh, this was Monday. So we have <laughs> really rapid, uh, in late summer, algal growth. There's a heron that likes to, to hunt in this area. So we have daily sediment deposition from the bird walking by. Um, we 
are a little um, obsessive with our sensors. We During the summer, we clean almost daily, uh, sometimes twice a day if we're expecting a storm. Um, and we do our quality control monthly because it coincides with our larger monitoring program. Um, and we, we try to keep things clean to get useful turbidity data, but it has just been an uphill battle. And I, I know a lot of you feel the pain, so this kind of feels like a support group. Um, we tried a couple of things to improve our turbidity data, the first of which was separating the bundle. So we moved the turbidity sensor up in the channel to hopefully get increased flow. That seemed to work for a little bit. Um, it extended the, in the fall, it, it worked wonderfully except for the leaf. We started getting leaf litter collection instead of just normal sediment. Uh, we adjusted our cleaning protocols for that. And now that it's springtime, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to have mattered. We're fouling up within about 12 hours. Um, so that's that for, for turbidity. Uh, our hypothesis is probably null at this point. Um, we're going to try some other things. Uh, but the most interesting data coming out of this is that we're seeing rapid temperature changes between upstream and downstream on a hot, sunny day. Uh, so the goal is to use this kind of data bank that we're building up of temperature, and then after the trees are established in 30 or 40 years, repeat this experiment and see if we can have any, you know, increased um, shading showing decreased temperatures in the channel. I'm hopeful. It seems logical. But um, the site also floods all the time. So there's a really good chance that our trees no matter how much we take care of them, might get washed away. If we get a solid storm like we did in August, where over three days it flooded five times, um, there is some concern that we might see loss of especially young trees. What is the blue? Yeah, blue uh, so these are the two sensors. The uh, blue is the upstream site, and the red is the downstream site. They're only about 500 yards apart from each other. Mm. Um, and the green line is the upstream flood stage, and the purple line is the downstream flood stage. Um, so we used this data when we were applying for a tree planting grant uh, from the DCNR, and they approved an adjustment to not use herbicides um, and just have an absurd amount of manual labor to maintain the invasive grasses from choking up the trees. They approved it on a year-by-year -year basis, so we'll have to see how the year one planting goes. Um, but it, right now, it looks like we have the volunteer group to do the weed whacking um, because the site is also, you can't get a mower down there. Uh, so we're just, we're having a really fun time thinking laterally about how to solve a lot of these problems. Um, but I think we're there at this point. Um, so what, right now, you get stuck? You get stuck, there's not actually an access trail. Uh, so we're carrying all of the trees down by hand, so they're all five and seven gallons. Um, yeah. And you've got so, a gator? Uh, a gator? Like we, we proposed the gator, but our um, preserve manager didn't like that idea because you have to go through a pretty low wetland area to get to the planting site. And uh, initially we had, uh, proposed zones one, two, and three, like tree plantings, and we adjusted it all to be zone one because even though we're several, in some places, several hundred feet from the stream, the entire thing, when it floods, turns back into a pond. Um, so the, one of the biggest assets that we have as a land trust with a science focus is we work with a lot of university students. Um, so we've had co-op students. Uh, there's Prem, he was our all-star co-op from last year. We have two more this year who are not featured. I have to update the slide. Um, as well as master's students uh, and high school students. So we get the opportunity to really expose a lot of people uh, to the work that we're doing with this water chemistry. We found that the data and the online portal really makes it super accessible. So it's been really, really fun. We brought several school groups out to kind of look because of how close our sites are to each other, 
and the massive disparity between what they look like. It's easy to you know, ask a little kid, where do you want to live? It's not, not downstream, uh, not downstream. So it's, that's kind of the, the down and dirty with what we've been doing um, with our two new sensor stations. They're going on private property. Um, we've been developing the relationship with these landowners to really take ownership. Uh, one homeowner has a young son, he's 12, who's really all about it. So we're hoping to get him active with the cleaning um, and like the, the data analysis and inputting the cleaning records. So it's, it's looking pretty, like it's gonna be a really fun summer. And we've been fortunate to work with what for our, our modeling um, because our sites are so bizarre in the way they behave given the, the presence of the dam remnants and the flooding rate. Um, it seems like it's been a good, useful. Um, we found it very useful. It seems like you guys have enjoyed it. Um, and then this is the temperature data. So um, I'll really quickly, what this shows is that when the air temperature is above 85 degrees and it's a sunny day, temperature at the downstream site can increase by two degrees Celsius compared to the upstream site. And what's important about that is the upstream site is immediately below a wastewater treatment plant that has artificially warmed water to begin with. So the true increase in temperature is probably closer to three, three and a half or four degrees. Um, and this is over the course of about 500 yards. So we really need to figure out a way to improve the stream cover quickly um, because this is having a really negative impact at our downstream streamages. Um, so where the blue is the difference, the difference between, so up and between down. the up and downstream. So whenever the downstream is hotter, that's the when yeah. So if it's above the axis, that means downstream is warmer, right. and if it's below, it means downstream is cooler. So all winter time. Oh, it's right. cooler, 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 and then in the summertime, it, it gets these massive spikes. Um, mm. So it, it's interesting. We've seen the fishes that hang out by our downstream sensor station. They'll they'll stay until March or April, and then they leave. Mm. So they're avoiding the kind of bath water situation. So yeah. that's, and that's due. That's pretty much due to the fact that that is the subject. That's the site you chose, chose that site where that area that was like all backed up and the dam that's like this totally like stagnant, flattened out area, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like it makes you wonder like you could. Oh, that's my 10 minutes. Like, I mean, it's just like that's a really like significant temperature increase over a short period of time. So it makes you just wonder about if you could, you know. Drill down on that and get specifics of like, so that you could use that little microcosm to kind of, you know, get an idea about temperature in on a watershed basis, in particular with regards to trout. You know, I mean, trout is such a charismatic thing. Mm -hmm. trout, I mean, it's such a temperature dependent thing. It's like, you know, it just shows that these isolated, really stagnant. You know, unshaded areas. Mm -hmm. What a major impact that has on so, temperature. One question: Air temperature. You get that from the sensor station, or weather? Station? No, no, we get that from the weather station. Oh, okay. So yeah. The sensor. It could be a lot hotter because it's the bottom. Yeah. Know? No. We um. Yeah. We, we kind of disregard the sensor station temperature. Okay. Um. This is all collected from. A local. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like one of the local weather. It might be the Westchester Airport. Um, so yeah, it which gives me an idea to do away. exactly that same thing here, mm -hmm. and I got a weather station twenty yards back there. So yeah, it, it's a really it's a really curious situation. Yeah. It caught us off guard, especially because last year there was so much rainfall. The water table was so high. It was our downstream site was clearly a gaining. Like it's a gaining stream reach, so there is some dilution, but the, it's hard to argue against a lot of direct sunlight onto the stream. So I'm curious to see if we have a drier year, if this is even more pronounced, um, if we have, you know, a drought sometime in the future, how dramatic this difference can be. 
Well, um, talk the solar uh, influx, cloudy mm -hmm. versus uh, yeah, uh, not cloudy. Yeah, it's a curious, it's a curious situation. You know your velocity, you can calculate the resistance time, the transit, and easily calculate the temperature increase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's slow. It's like a pond by the time it gets down to our second place. Problem. Probably. Yeah. Um, so probably. I don't know offhand. Slow enough that all the fine sediments collect on a regular basis. Yeah. Cool. Have you put a live station for the camera? Yeah, so we we talked about it putting Willis Creek in 